Welcome to Inspiration Today. Harry Stone is here all week long, the founder and the president of Voice of Evangelism Ministries. And this week we're talking about some very exciting things having to do with the feasts that God established for the children of Israel and for us today to celebrate. What's the spiritual significance? What's the prophetic significance of those feasts? And this week, today, we're going to be getting into the subject of Passover. And what's the spiritual and prophetical significance of Passover? Friday, I want to remind Mind you that we're going to be having a time of communion and prayer on the program. If there's any way for you to call, write, email, get your prayer requests in so that we'll know to pray for you specifically on Friday, join us. It's going to be a time when we're going to reach out, touch and agree together and believe that the power of God is going to touch your life and the circumstances of your life, that God is going to step into those circumstances and turn them around for you. It's going to be a great week here on Inspiration Today. Don't miss a single day. Well, right now I want you to please make welcome with me evangelist and my friend Perry Stone. Hello, Perry. Hello, and my friend David Sorella. Man, it's good to my have you here. My friend of many years. Yes, it has been a long time. And I, what a great opportunity. And you to are a special minister. brother. You I are a special that. friend. I appreciate it. Manifest that. is special to us. We are so we, excited to have you here. We that love on doing INSP. the program, and we get a lot of calls and viewers and emails of people mm -hmm. who've been watching it recently on INSP, and I appreciate that. You know, Perry, yesterday I just mentioned quickly about the hidden wisdom. Right. that Paul talked about in Corinthians, that he was going to share with, with the people the hidden wisdom of God. And, right. and we talked a little bit about types and shadows and pictures in the Bible. And, and one of the things I got from one of your other tapes was, was uh, on the temple. You know, you mm -hmm. and I did a series of programs together yes. on the temple and the, the, the furniture pieces. A lot of people and, have seen that. I'm I, I've, you, I've that, traveled and heard people talk about it. I saw a, you it with a, the models. It was a great series of programs. Yes, it was. We got to do a little tag team like oh, we're had doing a good today. Time. But you know, one of the great pictures that's in the Bible, we talk about the Bible not just being words and letters on pages, but pictures right. that God's trying to paint to us. You know, in that, in that temple video, you talk uh, about the fact that uh, the, the parallels, for example, there were five gates leading into the temple. And then right. once you got on the Temple Mount, there was an outer court, an inner court, and the Holy three of Holies. Three main entrances, yes. The three, and then the parallels of those five gates to our five natural senses that God gave yeah. us. Touch, see, taste, hear, and smell. And right. then our bodies, our, our, our beings our are a temple, body, of a temple of the Holy Spirit, yeah. and we are body, soul, and spirit. Right. Outer court, inner Tri -part, court, part three. Holy of Holies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the pictures that God puts in His Word are exciting and probably none as exciting to me as Passover. Right. The pictures that God <laughs> put in His Word about Passover for us. You know, this to me proves the Bible could never have been written by mortal man. No. Now, men were used to pen it, but they were inspired by the vision and revelation of God. Because just as you mentioned a moment ago how the temple is set up, and it equals to the five senses, five gates, and the, the three main entrances into the temple itself, the body, soul, and spirit, all these things, how numbers in the Bible m make sense. The number of seven always means completion. The number six always means man. The number three always means unity. Mm. You know, I mean, we could go on and on and just show how great God is. Yeah, well, even in and the temple, you know, the, the, the three main entrances, the way gate, the truth gate, way, the life. Way, truth, and life, yes. And Jesus coming and saying, I, I am, am the way. way. Yes. <laughs> Amen. The way to get to the Holy of Holies, the it's way to get him. to the Father is through <laughs> yes, me, sir. Jesus said. And one of the things that we're going to share with people today that I think people are going to find very interesting has to do with the Passover, uh, the Seder table or the Passover itself. Now, we have a napkin here with bread, and we're going to talk about that probably on the next program. But in front of me are these four beautiful cups. And um, uh, I started to say that they, I, they were made in Israel, but I looked at the bottom, and these were made in China. Okay. Well, it doesn't <laughs> so matter these are where Chinese they Passover cups. <laughs> but they're, they're very beautiful, and you see the design of the grapes on them. Now, what I want to do is share with you something about how that when the original Passover took place in Exodus chapter 12, there were two main things taking place. First of all, the lamb was the central picture. Mm -hmm. They were to take a male lamb, and uh, it was an innocent lamb, a picture of Christ, of course. And uh, without they, spot, without blemish, yeah, it had, it had to, be, had to a be a perfect lamb. In other words, it, it represented taking your best mm -hmm. and giving it to God. Yeah. That's what it represents. And so they took the lamb, and they did. They did several things. Now, when you take a lamb to roast it, because the Bible said they were to roast the lamb. The ancient Samaritans who in Israel live in what's called the West Bank today, right above Jacob's well on a mountain, Mount Gerizim, Mount Ebal, that area. 
I saw photographs where every year they do the actual Passover the way it has been done for centuries, all the way back to Egypt. This is really very important. Wow. They take the lamb and they cut the lamb from the neck all the way down and they remove all the insides. Mm -hmm. But then they take a small piece of a stick and they open the rib cage and they put that stick crossways. Then they take the top part of the feet and tie it to the top part of the pole, the bottom feet and tie it to the bottom part of the pole. Mm. And then they roast it that way. Mm. Now what's interesting is if you're looking at the lamb, you see a cross. You have a pole this way with what we'd call the cross beam inside the chest area. Hmm. And uh, in some of the pictures, they even take the intestines and they put it on top of the head of the ram, which forms a crown. Now, anyone that knows anything about where we're going with this knows there's your picture of your crucifixion of Jesus. It was done on a cross. There was a cross beam with a pole. Mm -hmm. And there was even a crown of thorns placed upon his head. Yeah. So this is how they roast the lamb. Now, in the time of the Exodus, which is, by the way, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, the Exodus, in Exodus chapter 12. Um, at the time that this took place, two things are happening. They take the lamb and they would cut the throat of the lamb to drain the blood out of it. They then took, more than likely, it's a hyssop plant. And on the left post, the right post, and the top post, they marked the door. Now, there's two important points here. Number one, most Jewish commentators will tell you that they believe that the way they marked it was with an X which in that day would have represented the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the letter Tav. Because the letter Tav, even in a Hebrew class, they'll teach you this, that every letter of the Hebrew alphabet has a symbol. Aleph, the first letter, is an ox. You know, you have Aleph, Bet, Gimel. Gimel is a camel, you know, all the way through. 21 letters, or 22 letters. The last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Tav, has always been a cross. It's either a plus or an X sign. Always, through history. So they say that there were, watch this, an X on the left post, an X on the right post, and an X in the middle. What's that a picture of? You know. Calvary. Calvary. Sure. How many crosses are reported? Three crosses. And there's one on the left, a man on the right, and Jesus is in the middle. Yeah. Now, it's interesting that they did not put any blood on the door, on, on the floor. Why did they not mark the floor? Because after all, could not the death angel slip through? That, because God said the blood was precious to him. They were to catch it in a basin. Don't, he said, don't let a drop of the blood fall to the ground. That's right. And, and why? Because Paul said in Hebrews that when a person has known Jesus and they turn from him, they trample under their feet the blood of God and put him to an open shame. So what would have happened is they would have been trampling under their feet that precious blood that redeemed them. Mm -hmm. So God says, there's no blood on the floor. You don't put it there. You keep it up you, because he is to be lifted up. He's to be high and exalted. So what happened was... The blood on the doorpost caused the death angel, which is called the destroyer, to pass by the Hebrew's house. Not, not one Hebrew died the night while in Egypt, the firstborn son died, the firstborn cattle is dying because they had no protection. Firstborn of every animal. Firstborn. Yeah. Now, the word Pesach, Passover in Hebrew, Pesach is interesting because I always thought it meant, theologically from how you're taught, to pass over. And it can allude to that, but do you know what the root word means? To spread your wings over. Hmm. So it wasn't just God saying to the people, oh, I could preach right here. <laughs> I'm going to pass you by so the death angel will not get in your home. It was also God saying, I'm going to spread my wings over your entire house. Hmm. I'm going to protect you. Now, remember the hmm. Bible Moses wrote in the wilderness in Psalms. Under the shadow of the Almighty I will abide and the, under the wings of God. Yes. Now, we know that alludes to the Ark of the Covenant that would be, was built and the wings of the cherub. Yeah. We know that. David but, wrote. Yeah but, yeah. yeah, but also Moses wrote chapter uh, 90 and 91 That's of Psalms. True. That's and true. When he, and when he, when, he, when he penned this, some of these Under your wings, things, I will abide, under your safely wings. abide That's forever. That's it, yeah. under the wings. So what's he talking yeah. about there? What he would have alluded to, probably Passover, where the blood of the Lamb, because see, Psalms 91 is the greatest psalm of protection in the whole Bible. Yeah. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow, shadow. of the Almighty. Amen. I will say of the Lord, and um, he is my refuge, my God, and him will I trust. Do you know, David, in Psalms 91, verses 1 and 2, are four Hebrew names of God, different names in those two verses. Yeah. And every one of those names has a powerful meaning. It reveals the whole nature of God just in the four Hebrew names of God in Psalms 91, verses 1 and 2. And he talks about, under his wings I will trust. Well, mm -hmm. in, because Moses wrote that one. David wrote the others. Because Moses wrote that one, 
I believe it alluded to the fact that God spread out his arms mm -hmm. over all of Goshen that night mm -hmm. to protect the to. people of God mm -hmm. from that destroying angel Absolutely that was taking right. out the firstborn. Because you see, if the firstborn sons of the Hebrews had been taken out, the firstborn always received the inheritance and the firstborn always received the, the double blessing. blessing. Yeah. Satan could have annihilated the future of Israel had the firstborn sons been killed. So the blood protected them well, from good, death. Perry. All right, now, yeah. when you come into the house, this is interesting. They are told to roast the lamb, now watch this, and eat it all. Right. Eat it all. Now that's kind of strange because if you check out the other sacrifices, the Lord would say, put the fat over here, right. put the intestines over here, put the kidneys over here. And he basically divided all the other sacrifices to where you ate parts of it, but you didn't eat other parts of it. And here it's really strange because he says, eat it all. Well, Dr. John Miller, who's a friend of mine, and you've seen him on our program manifest before, probably some of the folks watching him. Dr. Miller shared with me something called cell therapy. And he said in Europe, that, and they've been doing this for many years, that you can take the fetus of a lamb before its immune system is developed. And you take it and you can take, for example, the, the liver out of it or the heart out of it, and you can cut it up and they put it in saline solution and they inject it into people who are suffering with that organ, like if their liver has a problem or their heart, mm -hmm. and the cells heal the bad cells in the human body. He named politicians and movie stars that have been doing this for years. Mm, I never it's, heard of it's, that. It's banned, I think, here in America, uh, and I'm not going to go into the reasons why, but it's almost like over here, if it really does work, we don't <laughs> use it, you know. <laughs> Should I get off of that subject? But anyway, the thing is that I, I said, Doc, so, so whatever... The, the, the picture was, if the, the lamb's heart was into your heart, it would heal the cells. He said, correct. If the lamb's liver was used, into, in, in, injected in your liver, and I said, that's it. That's why God told them to eat all the lamb. Because anyone that would have had problems with a part of their body as they ate that lamb, God healed that part of the body. And that's why the Bible said, they came out of Egypt. You, you were going no, there, weren't no, you? No, no, you go you there. That's fine. There. That's fine. That's <laughs> fine. I saw it in your eyes. That's fine. That's why he said in Psalms, he brought them forth out of Egypt with plenty of gold and silver, and not a feeble Amen. person was among not them. Not a sick because, one among because them. Because they ate the lamb. And whatever was wrong with them, as they ate the lamb, that part of that lamb actually brought healing. Why? Because it was a picture of Jesus the who lamb later of God. stripes would take the stripes on his back, Isaiah 53, yeah. and with the stripes we would be healed. And it was a picture of the future Lamb of God. Now, I know you've got some comments here because I no, can... No, I'm I can, no, I'm going to You go ahead. No, I can see you stirring up no, here. Perry, you know, I just want to let the pe our friends at home know that when we get together on Friday and we have a communion service on Friday, yes. and Passover and communion are a celebration of the same. That's right. A celebration of the Lord's table. And we're going to talk about these four cups here in just a moment. But as we get together on Friday for a time of communion mm -hmm. to pray for you, what Perry's talking about right now is they ate the lamb. What, what did the lamb do? The lamb brought healing to them. The lamb brought deliverance to them. The lamb brought salvation yes. to them. It was eating that roasted lamb that gave the children of Israel the strength and the vitality to walk out of the land of Egypt. The lamb is what sustained them. And as we take communion together on Friday, I want you to get ready for that lamb of God as we partake of his body and his broken body oh, and, yes. and the blood. That same efficacious work that Christ did 2,000 years ago, I believe is going to become alive in your body. That same strength Praise to walk God. out of the land of Egypt, that same healing power, that same nourishment, that same, oh, I'm telling you what, Perry, <laughs> well, get ready Friday God. for God to step into the circumstances yes, of I your life that. in a special way. Something spe special happens when we properly discern the Lord's body. Yes. When we understand what really takes place at communion, what really is this cup that we partake of? What really is this body, this broken bread that we partake of? What does it mean? It has spiritual significance, but it has physical and natural significance as well. Just like when the children of Israel came out is what sustained them. It's what right, gave exactly. them their strength. Exactly. It's what gave them their healing. That's what communion can do for you. So you get ready huh. on Friday to join us. Well, you know, us. I told him we talk about the four cups. Let's and I, do and that. I better get into these cups before we run out of time. At a, at a Passover uh, supper, four cups of wine are used. Now, let me say something about the wine because there is a non-alcoholic wine that's made 
that, that many people use, even Christians use that. I'm going to stay and off that subject because a lot of people, Perry, wouldn't understand, but you know. Yeah. Well, so I know. Well, I, what I was going to, the point I was going to make is because in a Jewish home there are children present, the, the, all the writings say they take three parts water to one part wine, so there's no alcohol involved. Now, it's important, and I want to say this from a Christian perspective, it's important that when we take communion, I personally believe that you should not use wine with alcohol because alcohol has bacteria. And the wine represents the blood of Jesus, and Jesus' blood had no sin. He was sinless. So that's why in the New Testament it talks about the fruit of the vine. You know, it talks about taking the fruit, because the, the fresh blood of the grape yeah. would have been the fruit of the vine. So well, you'll, get, you'll, get, you'll get mad at me here, and I probably shouldn't interject this, but you know, Jesus said to the people, he said, John the Baptist came neither eating nor drinking, and he didn't believe a word he had to say. The Son of Man, me, I've come yeah. both eating and drinking. You don't believe me either. Right. So what we're going oh, to do? I'm, I'm going to leave. It we're going to we're going to get into, get into <laughs> the steel No, <laughs> we're but, running out of time here. Let's but, talk but about these cups. We, we can we can get into all that. It's it's an interesting concept. But yeah. the point is that they would not want children to yeah. have alcohol. That's the whole point. Now, you've got four cups here, and let me tell you where these four cups come from. Here we go. First of all, these four cups. The the reason they use four is because in Exodus chapter six, six and seven, it says God says this: I will bring you out. I will deliver you, I will redeem you, and I will take you to me a people. Mm -hmm. So those, those are why the, there's four mm -hmm. statements that God promises the children of Israel see, and that's why that there are four cups. Every one of these cups are named. Now what I'm going to do, I'm just going to go here from the left to the right and give you kind of an identity so that this cup, the first cup is called the cup of, cup of sanctification. The second cup is called the cup of affliction. The third cup is called the cup of redemption. And the fourth cup is called the cup of Hallel, or praise or consummation. It's also nicknamed the cup of Elijah. Mm -hmm. Now, basically in the Bible, we find all references to these four cups. It doesn't say first cup, second cup, third cup. But if you look at the phraseology, here's where the first cup appears. John 17, 19, sanctify them by, th by thy truth, thy word is truth. He is saying before he goes into the garden, or before he goes to the cross, I should say, he, he's talking about sanctification. Which is a prayer of Jesus to his Father. To he's his praying, Father, Father for his people. Mm -hmm. That's cup of sanctification, mm -hmm. okay? Then he mentions in Matthew 20, 22, the cup of affliction, all right? He mentions this second cup by using the term cup of affliction. All right, so there's the reference to the second cup. Now, when he is at the what we call the Passover or the Lord's Supper, that's what Christians traditionally call the Lord's Supper, it says he took the cup and said, this is the cup of the new covenant. And that would have been the third cup. That's the cup of redemption. So in other words, he took the third cup, which is a picture of redemption. In other words, being redeemed out of Egyptian bondage, back to their promised land. So Jesus says, now when you drink from this cup, you won't remember coming out of Egypt. You'll remember me bringing you out of your bondages. Right. So this is the cup that he drank from. Now, do you remember Jesus saying, I will not drink this with you again. I think I've got the reference, Matthew 26, verse 29. I'll not drink this, this cup again until we drink it anew in the kingdom. That's this cup. The fourth cup. This is called the cup of consummation. And a lot of Jewish homes, this one will be turned upside down and a child will go to the door to see if Elijah the prophet has come to announce the Messiah. And this is the cup that has, has these three cups have already been used in the New Testament prophetically. This one has not. This it represents the cup of consummation at the marriage supper of the Lamb when the bride who is the church meets with the bridegroom who is Christ and we, we seal the wedding at the marriage mm -hmm. supper. And this is the one that we'll drink from one day. Now all that's in a regular uh, Jewish setter, except you know we, they would not, of course not mention Jesus being the Messiah in a Orthodox home. But as believers now, Christians, we could look at this and see here is the perfect preview. Here's the perfect picture of Christ here, his redemption through his blood. Yeah. Well, he, it's interesting to me, Perry, that of the four cups on the table that Jesus would pick up number three, pass it around to his disciples and say, this is the new covenant in my blood, drink it. And why the cup of redemption? Why not the cup of sanctification? Exactly right. Why not the cup of affliction? Why not the cup of praise? It was the cup of redemption that he picked up. And, and, and the symbolism, yeah. the picture here that God's painting for us and even Jesus as he's with his disciples is a picture of the redemption that to redeem means to purchase. You know, and, and think mm -hmm. about the scriptures in the Bible that says you're not your own, but you've been bought, bought with, with a price. price. What's the price? The price is the blood that's of Jesus exactly that's right. been shed upon a cross for us. That's exactly so right. So Jesus picks up that cup of redemption. He says, this is, this is my blood. I'm <laughs> shedding it for you. I'm redeeming you. I'm right. buying you out of the world. And that's, I'm, and that's what he did. That's what in he other did. words, it's no longer redeeming us from Egypt. 
It is redeeming us out of sin, death, destruction, and really keeping us from an eternal hell, yeah. separated from God. Yeah. That's what redemption yeah. is. I tell you, there is so much to talk about. By the way, the silver is the color of redemption in the Bible. Three metals, gold, silver, and brass. Bronze. Brass is humanity. Bronze is humanity. Silver is redemption. Gold is deity. So anytime you see silver, and that, that represents redemption throughout the Bible. You know, there, we are just, again, scratching the surface <laughs> here, Perry. There's so much we could talk about even in the blood. Look at the scriptures that talk about without the shedding of blood, there is no remission right. of sins. Look at the scriptures where God says that life, life itself is in the blood. Well, I will tell you, I wish we had more time to talk about this today. We don't. But tomorrow, Perry's going to be back with us. We're going to continue talking about the seven feasts, about Passover. We're going to go f from the cup and the blood that was shed for us on Calvary to the bread. To, to Jesus said, this is my yes. body which is broken for you. But while we can't get to all the details here in the program, Perry has prepared a fabulous tape. It's called Seven Feasts of Israel. And all the things that we're talking about and a whole lot more that we're not even able to get to are here in this 90-minute videotape on the seven feasts of Israel, Passover, uh, Unleavened Bread, Feast of Pentecost, uh, Trumpets, Atonement. It's all here on this tape. And I tell you what, this is a tape that will help you understand not just the words of the Bible, but the pictures that God is trying to paint of the past, of what He's done for us, and the future, what He's about to do. Welcome back to the program. If, if you've just joined me today, I'm here with my dear friend Perry Stone. We've been talking about the seven feasts of God. Today we've been talking about the Passover. It's going to be a great week as we continue to talk about the symbolism and the pictures that God painted in His Word of things that have been and things that are yet to come. There's spiritual and prophetical significance to the feast, but there's also Perry blessing significance. God said at these feasts He would meet us and He would bless us in a special way. That's why we have camp meeting three times a year because God right. said, I'll meet with you, I'll speak with you, I'll give you my commandments. Every place I cause my name to be remembered, He said, I will come and bless you. So that's what camp meeting's about, and that's what these feasts are about, for God to come and bless you. And that's what we want to do, is bless you. As you sow a seed into the ministry here of the Inspiration Networks, to help us cover the earth with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, to reach out to the nations of the world with the gospel, we want to bless you with Perry's tape on the seven feasts of Israel. It'll be a great study for you to see the pictures and the reality of what God wants you to experience as you step into the fulfillment of celebration Celebrating these feasts, even in your Christian life, God wants to bless you. Perry, what are we going to talk well, about tomorrow? Well, next week I have what's, what, which is basically in English, it's called, it's just the Passover. And it's a napkin. It's, it has three chambers in it. We're going to talk about the bread, matzah bread, and we're going to show something extremely interesting that probably a lot of people have never seen. Well, tomorrow's I'll tell you what, don't miss tomorrow and make a note of Friday as we enjoy a time of communion together and prayer for your needs. Get your prayer requests in, call them in, email them. We want them to be here as we pray for you on Friday and believe for God to step into the circumstances of your life in a special way. We'll see you again tomorrow on Inspiration Today. God bless you. This program was brought to you by Inspiration TV. Help us share the inspiration. And you can support our mission online at inspiration.org forward slash give. Or call us at 800-517-6202. U.S. only. Thank you and God bless you.